Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead. It's going to be a, a really important that we get started on time as best we can um, because we've got lots to cover in a very abbreviated period of time. Uh, just to give you kind of a framework of where we're headed uh, with this study. This is one that, that really is going to build on itself. Okay, this is, um, this is one that uh, we're recording actually week by week because if you, if you, if you miss one, you're going to want to kind of, um, you're going to want to kind of catch up because it does week by week kind of build on itself. Um, this week is really going to be um, is really going to be sort of foundational on, on sort of how we interpret the Bible, how we read the Bible. Uh, next week, Leslie Lady is going to uh, address kind of um, uh, the, the family structure and, and marriage um, throughout history. Okay, so hers is kind of mine's more sort of biblical this week. Hers next week is going to be more secular in terms of sort of looking at the history of the family structure. The third week is going to be actually taking the biblical text that address uh, sexuality and actually interpreting them, thinking about them contextually. Um, the fourth week, we're going to talk about sort of why is this relevant for the church? What has this to do with the church? Why are we talking about this? Uh, we are going to take over Labor Day weekend. We are going to meet, but I know many of you will be away. And so that will be a much more kind of laid back session where it's a kind of a time to catch up and ask questions that you might have along the way. Uh, sort of a, 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 a time, a bridge time for us to sort of have some conversation before we get to the last week, which is going to be, um, as we've talked about, the possibility of our church uh, claiming an open and affirming status. Many of you have said, well, well what does that mean? Um, and that last week is really going to be aimed at what are the criteria uh, for claiming that status and what does that mean should we choose to do that, okay? So that's kind of where we're headed over the next several weeks. Um, I want to begin by just saying that I think it's important that we understand um, that the issues we're going to be talking about, we're going to have varying um, sort, of, uh, sort of beliefs and thoughts about. Um, and I like to say what, what I kind of, the way I, I like to approach this is, is to talk about this in terms of covenantal conversation. And I think John Pattison has a good quote uh, that I think defines this in many respects. He says, this doesn't mean that we'll agree on everything. And we always hope for consensus. We wait expectantly on consensus, but until that happens, we love each other. Our covenant relationship makes it possible for us to have conversations that are vulnerable, leavened with tenderness, and accountable to one another, because we're not going anywhere. It's only in this safe space that we can do the hard work, holy work, of learning to talk and to listen to each other well. I've found in the short period of time that I've been here that this is one of the gifts of this congregation, and I'm grateful for uh, the opportunity to have hard conversations and, and still very deeply care about one another uh, at the end of those conversations. So, look forward to this journey with you. Uh, if you would, please, let's open with a word of prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for Sandy Springs Christian Church, a place that's safe for all people to come to worship you to be in fellowship with you, to learn more about you and each other, to be in community. We are grateful for this time together, a time of learning, and just pray that you would open our hearts and minds as we have conversations about you and your work in this world. It is in Christ's name we do pray all these things. Amen. Okay, uh, just a couple of um, detail things. We, we've got a lot of folks in this room, um, and many of you uh, are, are longtime members of this church. Many of you are very new to this church. Some of you are visiting today. So I'm not making any assumptions about anyone that's here this morning. We're going to take this one step at a time and walk through this knowing that everyone is on a different place in the journey in terms of thinking about the issues we're going to talk about. The first thing I would say is, is that when we, when we do have conversation about the issues we're going to be discussing these next several weeks, this is never an us versus them, or, or we're not going to talk about it in those terms. Uh, those people, them. This is a we conversation. This is us. This is, we're talking about our church family. So in terms of the way we have these conversations, that's certainly important. Um, people, uh, everyone takes very seriously uh, the issues we're going to be discussing and have come to their own conclusions based on a lot of prayer and thought and discernment and experience in their own personal lives. 
And so we want to make sure that we respect each other uh, in those conversations and understand that and know that no one has come to any kind of conclusion uh, lightly. Okay? And finally, most importantly, you know, this is who we are as disciples. We have an open table which makes room for everyone. Uh, lots of different beliefs, lots of different thought. Uh, and so uh, we're, we're non-doctrinal, non-creedal for a reason. We don't have doctrines and creeds that tell us what to believe, right? And so this is why we have this diversity and we can agree to disagree at the end and that is okay. All right, so why now? Why are we having this conversation now? Uh, I've already mentioned that one of the pieces that's come up over and over again throughout our visioning uh, conversation, but quite frankly has been here since I began the search uh, process and conversation with you about being your pastor, uh, is the possibility that's kind of lingered in the background of this church of becoming open and affirming. Um, and so we hope that some study will help kind of fuel that conversation and, and help us along that journey. Um, the, the, the point being that the clearer we are about who we are, uh, the more effective we're going to be about doing God's ministry and sharing our message with the world. Okay? So that's where we're headed with this. Uh, and, and, and quite frankly, these are just conversations that are happening in our world right now to varying degrees. Every day we're in conversations that, that touch the issues we're going to talk about. And so it's relevant to our lives um, here and now. Okay, but as we get started, I just want you to take five minutes. I want you to think about, with your small groups at your tables, I want you to think about one, yes, I have no earthly idea. <laughs> is that a, is that, is that, a su Sunday school offering? It goes to our education for um, curriculum and stuff like that. So it's a Sunday, Sunday school offering apparently goes to our uh, educational resources uh, for the church. So there is a basket going around. Okay, um, so at your tables I want you to have a conversation about um, what is one thing that's happened in your life in the last 15 years that has kind of changed the way that you think about everything? One thing. One life event, one experience, um, an idea perhaps. But what's one thing that's different in your life today than it was 15 years ago that has kind of changed sort of your worldview? Okay? Spend five minutes at your tables and talk about it. So that was good. That was good. Conversations.
All right, so tell me, um, <clears throat> I know you didn't have uh, very long, uh, and I know not everyone got to share, but um, uh, tell me, tell me what some of those experiences were um, at your table. If somebody would be willing to, um, somebody would be willing to share, tell me what some of those experiences are in your life that have changed. Okay, uh, hold on a second, let me, um, Test, test. Okay, good. I want people to be, yeah, can you be mic person? That'd be great. Thank you. I want people to be able to hear these. And so when we ask questions and things, we do have another mic. Uh, Nancy McDaniel over here. Um, okay. Health challenges and this church. Okay. So retirement, health challenges, this church. What else? Yes, Dottie. Losing my husband. Okay, so a death in the family. Leslie, you may not get there in time. I know. We're, we're, and we'll, we'll wait. Uh, okay, so, so Dottie said losing her, her husband. Okay, what else? Yeah, Leslie. I'm okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Here, let me. It's a little easier to talk this way. Um, it's liberal versus conservative because my church in the UMC is more conservative than the, this church. And, uh, but I've always enjoyed coming to this church. For 14 years we've done okay. that, back and forth. Okay, so different perspectives for sure. Yeah, what else? Anybody else? Elizabeth, come in. Come in. Uh, uh, six years ago I almost died. Mm. Yeah, near near death experience for sure. Mm -hmm. Bunny, go ahead. Bunny, we we changed okay. our residence, um, so our community changed. Okay. Although the church same was the same. So moving, moving for sure, absolutely. Yeah. Other Charlotte. Charlotte, come in, come in. I never okay. would have guessed uh, 15 years ago that anywhere in this country it would be uh, sanctioned to have uh, wedding services for gays and lesbians. Okay, all right, yeah, yeah. Stuart, since he's right there, go ahead and shout it. Having kids. Having kids, yep, yep, <laughs> yep, that'll do it. Uh, the, Art, Art has one over here, I think. And then we'll, we'll wrap it up here after, after Art. We had uh, death, disease, marriage, retirement, and adoption. Mm. All, all at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, all at the same Okay. I was going to say, all at the same time, we are continuing to pray for you if that's the case, all at the same time. But, but yes. <laughs> so the, the point of this exercise is, so, good morning. Um, does, did, did those experiences change the way that you sort of think about God or understand God? Did those experiences change your theological perspective in any way, shape, or form? Yeah. Do those experiences then, then change the way that you might read a scripture reading? So for instance, um, let's take the parable of, um, of the prodigal son. Now if you're going through a particular time in your life where you're a parent and you're dealing with children, you might identify with the father. If you're a child having conflict with your parents, you might identify more with the prodigal son. If you're the elder son, really upset with your sibling, you might take the place where you are in life and your experiences inform the way that you interpret Scripture, right? Well, guess what? Paul took 15 years to write the letters that he wrote that we have in Scripture today. People ask, you know, well, why, why does uh, one letter that Paul wrote say one thing, uh, in particular about sexuality or gender, and in another letter he says it differently? Well, because Paul's evolving, just like we all do. Paul is growing in his own theological perspective, uh, in his own sort of um, way of understanding God. And all the experiences he's having along the way are changing that. All right, we've got to move fast, so this is a quick question, right? I think, I think some of it is due to the fact that he, he was uh, speaking to different, different cultures and different countries. Absolutely. No, you're absolutely right, and we're going to get into that. So I know this is review for some of you. Many of you have done um, all kinds of study in Scripture and sort of its basic sort of way it was put together. So I apologize if this is review for you, but it's very important that we all start from the same place on this, okay? 
uh, the Bible was written over approximately 1,500 years, okay? Uh, this, these are different authors that communicate different thoughts and beliefs and histories of different groups of people, different faith traditions from different time periods. Uh, to, Gary's, to Gary's point, uh, Paul himself uh, was writing to different communities and different cultures uh, at different time periods. All of that impacts what you're reading. We talk about the Bible, many people talk about the Bible being one book. It's not one book. It's a book of many books, right? Uh, and all those books were written by different people at different times. The Bible also comes from an oral tradition, okay? These are stories that were handed down generation by generation around, around the campfire. These were not things that happened and someone was um, sort of uh, watching it unfold and, and taking it down uh, note for note as it was happening. Uh, for instance, the, the Gospel of John. Uh, scholars have that dated between 60 and 80 years after uh, the events of Jesus. In other words, John is, is expected to have written those down 60 to 80 years after the crucifixion resurrection. Okay? Now, uh, who has um, been a part of uh, a crime scene or an accident and there were lots of witnesses? Y'all ever experienced this? Uh, John Mills? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, when you're dealing with, when you're dealing with um, eyewitness testimony, John, these are different. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, when, when you're talking about oral tradition, obviously the details are going to be different. This is why we have so many uh, different versions of Jesus' resurrection, okay? Um, <clears throat> you have to remember, too, the Bible today is printed in more than 100 different translations in English, okay? If you were to go on, like, BibleGateway.com and put in a, a, a chapter and verse or a book of the Bible, and you want to pull up a different version of the Bible, you've got almost 100 different versions of the Bible that you can choose from. All of them a little nuanced and a little different. Um, I, I tell, I've told this story before, but I'm going to tell it for those of you who have not been um, uh, a part of some of these conversations. You know, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in um, undergraduate. I'm in a class called um, Sects and, not sex, Sects and Cults uh, in, in American Religion. <laughs> We bring in different, uh, different traditions to come in and speak about what they believe. A Jehovah's Witness comes in. Um, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that when you die, you go straight to the earth, but you don't go immediately um, to the afterlife. It's not until Jesus comes back and takes the 144,000 that, of course, everyone then, or those 144,000 then ascend to heaven. So, one of my classmates asks, you know, hey, what about the reading in Luke where Jesus looks over at the other criminal on the cross and says, you know, today you'll be with me in paradise. Very truly, I tell you today you'll be with me in paradise. And the Jehovah's Witness says, well, we, you know, in, in the Greek and Hebrew languages, there is no punctuation, right? So scholars have to make the decision about where they're going to put commas, periods, you know, all, all the punctuation. So, so our scholars actually place the comma in a different place. So very truly, I tell you, comma, today I will see you in paradise, our scholars place the comma after the today. So very truly I tell you today, comma, I will see you in paradise. You see how that changes? So, uh, so when we're talking about um, reading scripture, we have to understand those nuances as well. Um, the other piece is that there are many different genres of scripture, okay? Um, so... Many of us know Psalm 23, right? The Lord is my shepherd. Beautiful poetic words about who God is that we read uh, in lots of different times. Um, but, but, but the Psalms are full of, of poetry and prayers. Um, you would read Leviticus very differently than you'd read the Psalms, right? Leviticus is law. Thou shalt, thou shalt not. Um, <clears throat> Philemon is, a, is, a, is an example of a letter that Paul wrote. Um, you know, Adam Hamilton calls this uh, reading other people's mail. When we're, when we're reading Paul's letters to these communities, we're, we're reading other people's mail. This was a specific letter directed to a specific group of people at a specific time addressing a very specific set of circumstances. They're not meant to be applied to all people at all times and all places, right? <clears throat> Luke, the Gospels, 
Um, these gospel is a very different kind of genre than everything else. It's not just history. Uh, these, these stories, uh, the, the way they're constructed, were aimed at um, sharing God's love to, to sort of um, convert people to follow Jesus. That's a very different way of communicating something than if you're just simply writing history or if you're simply writing a letter. Chronicles, uh, there are several books that we do attribute to history. You read your history books different than you read your poetry books, don't you? You interpret them. Um, and Revelation is its own whole bag of stuff, right? I mean, this is apocalyptics. You know, this, is, this is vision. Uh, you know, if you've ever had a dream before, um, you wake up and you convey that to your spouse, they're looking at you like you have three heads, right? Because what are you talking about that you just had this dream about, okay? Uh, this is a vision. This is a dream, okay? So obviously we read different genres all differently. Now, I want us to take a, a quick look at a video. Um, it's five minutes long, but I think he says it better than, than most. Uh, some of you may have seen this at some point along the way as well. This is um, Adam Hamilton um, in a study called um, When Christians Get It Wrong. And I'm hoping it comes up here. And if it doesn't, we'll, we'll figure it out. I don't know. Was the, pa was the power? That's the power. Yeah, there, yeah, we, there go. we go. Okay. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Hamilton is um, pastor of uh, Resurrection Church in Kansas City um, and uh, has written quite a few books uh, on this. Nope, don't want that one. There we go. Okay. We're almost there, I promise. And he's going to talk about how we interpret Scripture. And I've watched this so many times, I know exactly where to hit play. <laughs> when he picks up his Bible, watch. Yep, there it is. Okay. Um, your Sabbath day. Saturday or Sunday? Bible says that Saturday is the Sabbath. Starting Friday night. Saturday is sunset. Bible says that you're not to work on the Sabbath. That includes mowing your yard, trimming your bushes, taking care of things around the house. You know what the penalty is for working on the Sabbath? Death. Gets the death penalty. Capital punishment. For working on the Sabbath. Do you obey that command, or do you interpret it somehow differently? Bible says it. I don't believe it. That settles it. Well, you say that's all the Old Testament, you know. What about the New Testament? Well, okay, so Jesus says, if your hands cause you to sin, cut them off. If your eyes cause you to sin, gouge them out. Now, if you're a biblical literalist and you take the Bible seriously and literally try to live it, would you please pull up your snubs for us? <laughs> But you read that and you know that, that Jesus didn't mean to be taken literally there and said that's a hyperbole and so you're meant to take sin seriously. But, but well, let's say Jesus, he speaks about not storing up for yourselves riches on earth where moth and rust grow and thieves break in and steal. But how many of us have four little cake plans, retirement plans, planning for the future? We say, well, that's prudent. You're supposed to, in fact, I even taught that you're supposed to be saving for retirement for your kids' education. But Jesus tells us that we don't store up for ourselves treasures on earth. What do you do with that? My suggestion to you is that we have to bring an interpretive lens to every part of the Bible we read. That you're supposed to engage your mind and your intellect and, and your heart and the Holy Spirit's witness and the greatest commentaries and the, and the latest thinking and bring all that to bear when you're studying the Scripture. I will tell you that if I didn't do that, I probably would have stopped being a Christian a long time ago. Because there are things in the Bible that I find disturbing. Portrayals of God that are difficult to reconcile. Not very many, but a few that are difficult to reconcile with Jesus Christ. If your children disobey you, what does God tell you to do to them in the Old Testament? Stone them to death. I see a few of you have one of your children. But <laughs> if a priest's daughter becomes a prostitute, do you know what he's supposed to do? He's supposed to burn her alive. Now I want to know, how do you reconcile if God says that the priest should take his daughter and burn her alive, burn her to death? How do you reconcile that with Jesus who sat down with prostitutes, who went to his feet? 
I mean, so you're right, that's cool. You know, how do we put those things together? Now, the, most of the Old Testament picture of God is gracious and merciful, just like in the New Testament, but there are those places. Here's the question, did God change? Or did human understandings of God change? And when you begin to deal with the text, part of what I'm suggesting to you is that you understand that when we say the Bible is the Word of God, interestingly enough, that phrase, the Word of God, the Word of the Lord, appears over 200 times in the Bible. It almost never refers to something that's written down. It almost always refers to the Holy Spirit speaking to an individual, revealing God's will to an individual. And when Jesus preaches, he's preaching the Word of the Lord, and that doesn't mean that he's going verse by verse to the Old Testament. He's telling stories and teaching about God, and it's called the Word of the Lord or the Word of God. The angels reveal the word of the Lord to people, and the word of the Lord gives life. It's dynamic, it's not something written down now. It can be written down. But when we read the Bible, part of what we recognize is we know some of the authors who wrote this. We know Moses wrote portions of it. We know Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We know the Apostle Paul and Silvanus writing for Paul and Paul couldn't write. They were trying to express what they experienced and know of God when they believed God's will was. They were speaking to people who needed to hear a specific word, and God was speaking through them. But that word of God was always coming through human beings who brought with them their own theological presuppositions, their own technological and scientific understandings, their own historical circumstances. And God is speaking through them. Now it's interesting, when we think of the word of God, in the Gospel of John we read that in the beginning was the word. God's desire to communicate to his people. And the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh and lived among us full of grace and truth. Who is the Word? Jesus is the Word of God. He is the unmitigated Word of God. All other words of God in the Scriptures came through human beings living in historical circumstances and time. But in this case, God says, I'm going to communicate and I'm going to wrap that communication, that sermon, in a person. So when Jesus comes and speaks to us, speaks to us it is the clearest Word of God that we can receive. Now even that Word of God is told to us by human authors. But here's, for many of us, the interpretive and theological framework we use in reading the Bible. When you read the Bible, I always read everything else through the lens of Jesus Christ. He is the clearest word of God. So everything, if I find something in the Old Testament that doesn't line up with how Jesus acted or what he did, then I say, this is the clear word, and I have to interpret that in the light of this word. So the, here's what I'm trying to share with you. When you read the scriptures... I'm inviting you not to take an overly simplistic approach that turns the Bible to a weapon that hurts people. Okay, will you switch that out? Okay. I just think he says it better than I probably could. Um, there are a few things that come out in this clip that I think are important to kind of think about um, when we're reading Scripture. Uh, he says we missed a little bit on the front end, but one is that the Bible is not an overly simplistic book. Okay. This is not a book that um, is easily read and understood. Uh, and if we take it as such, we're missing out uh, on so much depth and complexity and nuance. Um, if the Bible is the story of God, and we cannot fully know God, this is pretty complex stuff, right? And if our Bible is aimed at, in part, a relationship with God, and one another, helping facilitate that. Are relationships easy, the ones that matter? They're pretty messy, to the sermon series point uh, we're, we're dealing with right now. This is complicated stuff. Um, <clears throat> the other piece that he brings out is, um, is that context is so important uh, when we're reading Scripture. Um, so I remember a preaching professor one time talking about uh, a story of being, um, she and, and some, some friends were at this um, kind of golf club, sitting outside, um, enjoying um, some wine, some lunch, uh, and the, the name of the golf club was, was Barren Ridge Golf Club. And they were all kind of sitting around going, well, that's... Why would you name a golf club? It's pretty bleak, barren ridge. You know, that just doesn't make any sense. Um, well, so come over the, the waiter and, and they start talking and they start asking, you know, where, where's the name come from? Because it's not the name of the town. They're just trying to figure out where's the name of this, this place come from. And he, he went on to describe that this is actually a blueberry farming community. And um, when you harvest blueberries, one of the things I did not know is that you actually rake them. Okay? And, and when you're done raking them, they leave a kind of beautiful crimson color on the ground. 
Um, and there's all these beautiful rock formations all around the area. And they refer to those beautiful, complex, very unique rock formations as the barrens. And when they harvest the blueberries in this community, there's this beautiful crimson that pops out from all between these barrens. Barren Ridge Golf Club. Not so barren, right? Beautiful. Context is everything. It's so important uh, when, we go, when, we, when we talk about um, reading scripture. Um, and we, he, already, he already went into the things, you know, uh, that we talk about when we, when we talk about the inconsistencies. I mean, it's very difficult, very difficult to be a, a biblical literalist. It's very difficult. Um, how many people like to eat shellfish? I do, you know. How many people are wearing clothes of blended fabrics this morning? Yeah. Um, he went into the most extreme ones about what we do with our children, you know, discipline, the Sabbath, you know. The, you all are familiar with these, okay? But these are the kinds of things that are in Scripture. And in fact, in a couple of weeks when we actually go to the text uh, to read some of these Scriptures around sexuality, uh, quite frankly, we don't read them very often because they're pretty hard to read, they're not enjoyable stories. So we'll, we'll get to that here um, in, just, in just a couple of weeks. Um, so then, okay, what do we do with this? All right, we've just gone through how the Bible was put together. Uh, we've talked about it in very uh, much more sort of academic ways. So then what do we do with, with when we talk about the Bible being inspired? Okay? Uh, many people will point to uh, 2 Timothy and, and say, okay, well, well, it says all scriptures inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. Can we still read the Bible in the way that I just described it and still claim it to be inspired? Yeah? Why is that? To say more about why, why that is, Donnie. Yep. It can still teach us something of God. Yeah? I want some of you to be able to hear these. What else does it mean for you to be, for, for, the, for the Bible to be inspired to you? Yeah. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Speak loud. I'm loud. <laughs> um, I think um, inspired, it's people who love God, and uh, many things inspire them. I think um, some of the uh, Beethoven, I think, you know, they, had, they were inspired by, um, by love and by the love of God, and they wrote beautiful, you know, music. Mm -hmm. And in the same way, the Bible uh, is inspired. Is ins the men who wrote the Bible, <clears throat> heavy emphasis on men, um, loved God and were therefore inspired to write what they wrote, but it was still written by humans. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there are many who would who would kind of who, who kind of study the, the, the history of scripture, how it's put together, and take kind of and can very easily take a more pessimistic view and look at it and go, you know, it was a bunch of men that wrote this and over time and they all had their own agendas, you know, so how do we know what's true and what's not? You know, how do we know um, whether or not to believe this stuff, you know? How does it have authority then in our lives?